Welcome everybody back here to Siegel Talks at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center from the Graduate Center CUNY Midtown Manhattan. And uh, it's again a sunny, warm day here in New York City. And the, 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 the wind of change in a way, a warm wind is coming through the city, looks so different. Uh, still, we see very little of tourists, uh, but uh, the mood on the street seems to be so much better than when we started last March on the entire summer. So um, we have a feeling that perhaps the worst is behind us. And um, what we have talked about in this entire year is not only how do we experiencing it, what needs to change, what will happen after the time of Corona, actually, at least to our uh, uh, um, impression, this time is starting now. In some parts of the world, it is not. It's very complicated. Latin American countries, Chile and many others, uh, Brazil, Argentina, but especially India is hit so hard. And um, but we and in, in, in Western Europe, it seems like uh, 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 the tides are turning. What really will happen, we don't know. We cannot seal the borders. Even if everybody would be vaccinated in the US, that would mean nobody would be allowed to come in. Uh, the extreme uh, Catholic or religious right refuses vaccinations. Uh, many Republicans refuse. And so what will happen if the Indian variant that seems to be uh, so much stronger, 60 to 80 percent, some studies have changed what will really happen, especially to young people who haven't been vaccinated because they had to wait in line. We do not know. And what does it mean for theater, for openings? So it's uh, 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 still a, a complex time. We are coming to an end of the Siegel Talks on the time of Corona. This is our last week. That's why it's important to have our two guests here with us, Brian and Alec. Uh, we um, think uh, it is now also time to take action, to be part of the change. This is what we all um, talked about here as a very end of our Siegel Talks. We will do a 24 hour marathon online to support our colleagues in India who are up all night uh, collecting and connect, collecting resources and connecting uh, people often from rural areas who only have phones uh, to and no internet to hospitals, the few that are still working with the doctors or nurses haven't died and there is some oxygen left in the walls with enough pressure to really get pumped into the bodies. It's a disastrous apocalyptic uh, moment there. And what our colleagues have done uh, is heroic. And But so many people around the world have done that. And all the boasts, also the two who are here um, um, with us. So. Um, I would like to welcome uh, uh, our two great uh, guests. It's Brian Rogers from the Chocolate Factory, Alec Duffy from the Jack Art Space, and anyone uh, who uh, lives in New York, follows, participates, or loves theater, contemporary theater, avant-garde, the step ahead, where ex word of an experiment is really means an experiment. We can go right, can go wrong, like in science, like in research, what we do at universities. Those two guys have been leaders. They have created spaces um, and they run them. They have a vision and in a very difficult and complex circumstances. They have been able to keep them alive. It's not easy in New York, in the Americas. It's much more complicated than in Europe. We have our highest respect and like the invisible dog when we had Lucian with us. Um, <clears throat> these uh, spaces run because of the people who run them like the Ellen Stewart Theater at the great of La Mama. Um, so these are heroes in a way of our uh, scene. Uh, they have been connected to our prelude festivals, but also to the very, very fabric and so many artists have walked through. Both institutions are going through uh, tremendous changes on their own, but now in the time of Corona, the time of Black Lives Matter, they of course are magnified and the choices they make are so important because they represent the spirit of the New York theater community, of theater artists, moral, ethical, social, and artistic aesthetic values. So it's a great, great, great honor to have uh, both of them with us. Brian and uh, uh, Alec, welcome. And where are you guys? Alec, oh, maybe I'm you sitting... start. Oh, Brian, I'm... yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Alec. I'm sitting inside the, the future Chocolate Factory Theater space in Long Island City, Queens. My goodness, no one has has seen that yet. So you're you're living in the future. You're in the future at the moment. Can you show us a, a little bit? Is that a possible? Or is it? I mean, this is this is not the part of the building where artists uh, will work. This is uh -huh. where all of our sort of backstage and it's quite a mess. We've literally just 
completed moving all of our stuff from the old space um, into the new space. We haven't had a chance to sort of really unpack and move in just yet, but we've managed to lug all of our stuff at least. So you did it over the weekend or? Mm -hmm. Incredible at speaking of change, huh? Mm -hmm. I like, where are you? I'm in Catskill, New York. Uh -huh. And uh, my wife Mimi is a set designer. Yes. And so she's actually part of a dance residency here, a bubble. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm up watching the kids while she's in there, although she's got them right now. Uh, uh -huh. So that's where I am. Beautiful Catskill. Yeah, great, the great uh, Mimi. Oh, yes. And uh, she designed the shelves behind you. Uh, <laughs> set design. Oh, it was already there, I guess. Right? But this it looks very, very good. Uh, I said before, both of you look like captains in spaceships uh, from the future. <laughs> Let me tell our audiences who do not know so much about you. We have not only listeners from North and Latin America, but also from around the world. And not everybody is so familiar. Um, to everybody know, these are the places that make New York, New York theaters uh, that create work, but also host artists, create, commission new work. And um, instead of being a touring place, instead of you know uh, creating commercial productions with the hope to have a return of the money, these are true uh, uh, um, uh, theater makers in a sense of uh, a mission and a vision to have a social impact, artistic impact, to give meaning to our lives, to also give a space for artists as a symbolic, a real, and imaginary space, and to discuss ideas you know, that the society needs to look at. So these are most valuable spaces, like here Art Center, also Sent Ends, in a way, so many, many others. I'm sure I'm forgetting the, the uh, uh, Na National Black Theater and so many, many other places who do this PS. Uh, and, um, but both of them are now here um, with us. So um, Alec uh, is the founder and co-director of the OB winning Brooklyn performance and civic space is a great thing. He calls it a civic space. Jack was the mission of fueling experiments in arts and activism. So arts and activism are the keywords here. Together with former Jack co-director Diara Wright, he conceived Reparations 365, a series that examines the topic of, of distributive justice for black Americans for performances, conversations, and workshops. Prior to founding uh, uh, Jack, he had a, a life uh, that is, of course, closely connected, but he had the theater company, Hoy Palloy, as uh, many uh, New Yorkers know and remember so well, with whom he has created many original works, including the well-known uh, Three Pianos that won the OB, and it's based on Schubert's Winter Rises song cycle, and it was co-written and performed with David Malloy on The Great Comet and, uh, and Rick Burkhardt. So, um, he has uh, a credential. We all are, of course, jealous and everybody of us would like to have such a record to say, I created a space, I make a social artistic contribution and I want an own OB for my artistic work. Uh, Brian um, is a director, filmmaker, video and sound artist. And he is that truly, he creates work pieces. He's one of the few also like Alex who direct create artistic work, but also our arts administrators define a new profession in a way, this kind of hybrid form that has been a long time and with theater, but they also run this in New York City. And this is a quite a, a complex uh, undertaking. He created uh, the Chocolate Factor, which supports the creation of theater, dance, music, and multimedia performances. And that's very important, I think, his affinity to, to the new technologies uh, who seem already like old now, some of them, when he started out, they were new. And he continues that with the really new emerging uh, technology. And uh, he has now a 5,000 square foot facility in Long Island City in Queens, uh, very close to Manhattan, easy to get to uh, all the spaces, also the Jack spaces. So people um, who are visiting New York or in Manhattan, other places, just try to get out there. These are important and great places, fun to travel to, and you see different neighborhoods. Since 1997, Brian has conceived and directed numerous large scale films and performances at the Chocolate Factory and elsewhere, including Screamers, which was at Abrams Art Center, the Barishnikov Art Center, Hotbox, Fiat's Crossing the Line Festival, the Great Coil Festival, Vallejo Gantner created, Impact Center, and the Bessie nominated Selective Memory. So um, both of them uh, 
are um, what we call real. Their street credit is uh, impeccable. They have been friends of the Siegel Center, also connected to our uh, private festival. We really follow their work, we admire them, and they have given space to artists and encourage them to create new work, which is so rare and it's invaluable. So um, we heard a, just a tiny bit from Brian, but maybe Alex, now from you, where are you? What's going on? We all wonder what's going on at Jack. What happened already in Miracle that you could pay the high rents in the time when there were people who said would make donations. You were in the trenches to make that happen. They were enormously high. Um, but now what happened in Corona to, to Jack Art Space? Yeah, so it was um, a few, months, I guess, after the uh, pandemic hit, uh, it became clear to us that our landlord was not going to offer us rent relief. Um, I had lobbied for a couple months and finally, after saying no so many times, uh, it was clear that the landlord was not going to budge. How and long were you I'm, in there? How long were you in there? We had actually moved to a new space, just uh, opened it six months prior. Um, so we had been in our original space for seven years. And mm. then I moved to this new space, built it out, and then uh, had just opened it. Um, so it was a relatively new relationship with the landlord. Um, and it was at that time that, uh, that finally was, it became clear that he was not going to budge, that it became very dire for us. Um, and it, How high was the rent, if we may ask, for a small yeah, yeah. nonprofit? Uh, makes... About $7,000 a month. Incredible. Plus, it's close know. to $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. just to race, to have the water on and to have a space. Right. And so that's when it began. And, and at the, around that time, it became clear that the pandemic was going to last much longer than we originally thought or the shutdown would. Um, and that's when it became pretty dire for us, a perilous situation. Um, it was around June and July, though, that uh, you know we put out a call to our supporters and, and really laid it out on the line that we were not going to survive this um this this shutdown without their support and so a lot of them pulled through um we we got some some special special help from well the nea had a had a, a relief grant that we were able to get um new york community trust did uh, and the howard gilman foundation was especially generous to its grantees during that time and so it was about late August, late August that we knew that we were actually gonna be okay. Um, that as long as the pandemic didn't last for five years, um, or you know, at least you know, that it would be done in the, in the next year, or the shutdown would be, would be lifted in the next year that we would be okay. And so that's, that's when um, at around the same time, actually, we, were, we had this empty space, right? And, and we were trying to find a way to put it to use in a very, in, during the critical emergency time where New York was losing 900 residents a day. Um, and so we reached out to the city, offered our space for, I don't know, testing, for emergency treatments, whatnot. We didn't get anywhere with that, but one of our board members um, is an activist and she's actually a member of a mutual aid group who had just lost their space, this was actually in April, um, had just lost their space in Bushwick. Uh, and we quickly came to a realization that um, that would be a great way to use our space, would be to give it over to this mutual aid group as a food distribution hub. And so that's what we did. And so for then the remainder basically of the year, uh, Jack was a food distribution hub um, with over, you know, with dozens of volunteers uh, working every week delivering food to about 200 families per week that lived in a um, public housing complex uh, nearby. And that's basically how we spent 2020. Uh, 2020. Uh, when the year turned over into 2021, um, that project uh, closed, closed shop. And then we started offering our space to artists for residencies. And so we have had um, now seven artist residencies in our space of two weeks each. Um, and are starting to have a parallel set of residencies out on Governor's Island, courtesy of Beam Center, which is, is, is a group that's working out of Governor's Island. So that's what that's the, the prime focus of our work over the past year has been that split of the, of the food distribution and then these artist residencies. So to put it together, you, you just moved into a new space, quickly found out it was impossible 
to, uh, to maintain it. There were moments it looked like you had to move out. You rallied support, so you had to do a lot of fundraising. Then it became a social kind of network uh, support for the neighborhood. And then you started slowly residencies. So, uh, Brian, how, how was the year for you? Um, I mean, I would echo a lot of what Alex said. The early months of it um, um, were quite terrifying. I mean, outside of you know, the state of the world at that time, um, and, um, and those terrors, it was really unclear to us um, how, we would, how we would make it through. I mean, the short term, you know, it, it, the, the timing of all of it was such that um, we, had, we um, were forced to cancel um, well over half of our season. Um, and so we had a quite significant cash outlay to artists. We felt it was important just to honor our um, monetary commitments. Um, to those artists who were relying on that in some cases just to survive. Um, and we were forced to cancel our annual gala, which, you know, in a good year would net us $100,000. And so we, that, that money didn't come in. Um, and we were also in a very strange moment. So we, we were, we're in this moment, we're in this period of um, sort of slow rolling transition, you know, where, where, you're, where you're seeing me now is a building um, a 7,500 square foot building that we own, that the city of New York um, helped us to purchase um, a couple of years ago. And we've been, we've been sort of planning to renovate this building um, and then have a sort of smooth transition from the, our, our current rented space into this space. And one of the um, results of the pandemic is that we had completed the planning process for this renovation, but the actual, um, the process of, working with the city to unlock its financial commitment to our renovation got completely stalled and went nowhere now for a year and a half. Um, and at that, and simultaneous to that, our lease on our current rented space ended. Um, and we were able to negotiate with our landlord um, a modest rent reduction, but he also um, did not agree to renew our lease. So we went on to a month to month rent relationship. Um, um, and we weren't really able to do much with the space. So we were paying rent month to month, not knowing if we would be able to stay there um, and not making a whole lot of use of it. And so we sort of gradually came to the conclusion that it just made sense for us to move into this building that we own this anyway. And so we, we embarked on a, a very low budget DIY fix up of it just to make it safe to occupy. Um, and made the decision to move. So we will be fully in here as of um, July 1st. But to Alex's point, we really survived due to the generosity of some private funders. Um, um, the Gilman Foundation in particular, the New York Community Trust, all of these various emergency grants and, and the funders who just you know, augmented their, their, um, their annual general operating support is what it helped us to, and the PPP loan that, um, is what enabled us to survive through this, honestly. Um, and then there's also just the, the logistical problem and the trauma um, that all of the artists have experienced, all those works that were canceled and couldn't happen, that we now need to figure out if we can find money to pay them a second time to actually make these works and show them, um, combined with the commitments that I've, um, and I, I don't know sort of what timeline you, I mean, I think it's, I think the situation is probably not that different, Alec, but we make commitments to artists often quite far in advance. Um, and so each postponement or cancellation is just sort of a, um, it just augments, it makes the problem larger because, you know, I've made commitments to artists through, at this point through 2024. And so if I'm pushing something back, everything's being pushed back um, and how to, and as an organization on a, on a, you know, we're still a quite small organization to, to do all, to, the money piece of this is just an incredible challenge and how to um, navigate all of all of that and support all of these works that I had promised to support is an interesting problem to solve that I haven't actually figured out how to solve but but we have survived so I, I really do um, on that level like I can't complain but those early months were were quite um, intense <laughs> for me um, just seeing all of this kind of disappear and wondering how we were going to navigate it.
Um, and it really is to, due to the generosity of the field, I guess, on a certain level that um, enabled us to continue. But it was existential for both of you. No, for, for me at least, yeah, absolutely. How, how did you both feel as, as, you know, as Brian, as Alec, as, as person, how did you go through that? Um, I'll start. So we have toddler twins and uh, a lot of the focus was um, just on, on being able to take care of them. Uh, they had been in daycare before then, but then, you know, that shut down. So Mimi and my uh, hands were really full with them uh, for that first year, basically, of the shutdown. Um, so it was even hard to just be able to grab a couple of hours for work during the day. Um, that was exhausting. And, uh, you know, as a father, um, just, le just, just this was not how it was supposed to be, right? The, the, the way that you think about it or in terms of what, how, how to handle, how to balance uh, your career, your work, um, and, the, and the raising of your children. Um, so for me, it was, that was the, probably the toughest part. Um, thankfully, no one in my close circle um, was, uh, got really sick. I had some, some friends who, who were sick um, with COVID, but, uh, but recovered pretty swiftly. Um, so that was, the, no, that was the main struggle for me, was just how to keep it together. Yeah, no, yeah, so I second what, what Alex said. It was just, for me, the struggle of, I mean, like the, the pattern of my life pre-pandemic was so um, oriented around travel and watching performances. Um, and, you know, those things all abruptly went away. Um, and so for me, it was, there was just, um, and I'm still just coming out of it, I think, in a way, just um, struggling to find a way to, to do something useful with this platform that I have. This thing, I mean, and not, I mean, so, so trying to make sure that, trying to keep my organization alive and do something useful for the community that I'm attached to. Um, and we did find some ways to support artists work with, with residencies, but that was incredibly stressful because the conditions under which that could happen were unknown for a long time and then constantly changing and quite logistically challenging. Um, but we did manage to do some of those things. But I think I just felt quite disassociated from um, my own utility as, a, um, as an arts worker in this context, because it's so hard. It was so hard for me to understand what I could do that would be helpful or of use to the field or add some value to the world. Um, And so, yeah, it just kind of, it, it, I, I think I spent months just feeling as if I was watching a movie of my own life sort of move past. And it's been, it's been quite interesting to sort of emerge out of it in, with the speed at which it seems to be happening. You know, I, it, um, it felt like we were sort of parked in the station and then all of a sudden in May, like, you know, they put on the gas. So it's like, we're open again, we can do this and sort of jumping back and trying to then navigate with artists, the, um, their own existential crises that they've ex experienced and this notion that we should now return to a world of making and showing work. Um, and I think there's, and I may, I may, forgive me if I'm going on too long, but I think one of the really, um, the challenges of this moment um, or our poor opportunities of this moment is that I think we, um, as a community, we're able to recognize during this last year that there are um, structural things about how we work that were not serving us and really need to change. And now that we're, I think, on a kind of um, fast moving train toward reopening, I think we, there's, a, um, there's a fear that we're just going to rush back to the way things were before. And, I, and speaking for myself, um, I think that I need to, to work differently. My, my organization and me personally need to work differently um, in the next phase of this. How, how is that for you, um, Alex? Are, are things going to change? Uh, from, a, from a Jack level, um, 
it's actually it's actually this whole shutdown has given us a lot of opportunity to reflect and to envision and to plan in a way that we Jordana, our co-director and I had not had um, in the run-up to the pandemic. We had just opened a new space. We're still getting to know the space, had audiences coming through every week. Um, so to even have a moment to reflect was a was a miracle during that time. Um, during the shutdown, we actually had a um, conveniently had a, a strategic planning process uh, planned. And so we actually had a lot of space to reflect upon where we wanted Jack to go, how we were going to get there. And also um, being able to listen, uh, listen, there's so many opportunities like your um, series here to listen to people talk about what they want in, in the new American theater or the new American performance scene. And that was extremely helpful for Jordana and I to just be taking this all in while we were creating our a plan for the coming years. Um, so very specifically for us, that, ref that was reflected in a plan where we're looking to, for example, double artist fees um, by next year. We're looking to now give artists more time in our space than we had previously given them. So a week longer um, in our space to prepare a, a production than we had before. Um, we are looking to, for Jack to reflect uh, an even more diverse city than it currently does. Um, and so we have been, we've been, Jordana and I have been really um, had an opportunity to check out work that we, we, kind of didn't have before the pandemic because we were so focused on our own space. So whether that's watching videos of, of artists' work, um, meeting with them over Zoom, getting to know them, um, now showing them our space, you know, inviting them into our space to have conversations about work in the future. Um, we've been thinking about accessibility, um, really inspired by people at other theaters talking about what radical accessibility could look like where someone who's disabled doesn't have to choose a specific, doesn't have to fit into whatever specific date the accessible performance is, but just can expect it when they go to your theater that there's going to be uh, ASL interpretation, that there's gonna be open captioning, that there's gonna be um, audio description available. That is, a, that is a vision for us, it's not, uh, Currently, reality won't be reality this year, but it's it's there's been an opportunity to say that's what we want, um, and to also be be looking at other organizations and seeing what they they've been doing and being inspired by them. Um, you know, I can think of you know Abram Abrams Art Center and their uh, installatory um, fires that they're having outside during the pandemic, led by Emily Johnson and other Native American artists. Um, really inspired by that, uh, that connection between uh, indigenous work and uh, arts presenters. And we're looking to, um, to, to, we've already started those conversations so that we can start doing that in the future. Um, so for us, it's been a, a real, a, a time of awakening, um, a time of really taking a deep breath, uh, seeing what we want to be, um, and trying to step into that as um, intentionally as possible over the next couple of years. Um, specifically in terms of performance, yes, we had, um, we had planned to open in September for performances, for live performances, but have now moved that forward to the end of July. So we're going to actually open our space for, the, for, the, for paid performances for the first time at the end of July with, the, uh, this trumpeter, year. Yeah, this year uh, with the trumpeter, Peter Evans, who's going to be leading, leading his ensemble being and becoming for three nights. Um, that'll be our first uh, in full capacity, uh, which for us is about 60 seats. We're an intimate venue. Um, so that'll be, our, that'll be our first step into public performance again. Brian, what, what, what do you think, what was wrong before what has to change and what could really change? I mean, I think it mirrors the conditions of other fields, just the way in which um, labor is valued, the way the, um, the contractual or just the, just the power dynamics and relationships between independent artists and presenting institutions, the, um, 
the power dynamics between performers and directors and choreographers. There's, I mean, um, as I mentioned briefly before um, this Zoom began, I was part of a group, um, a small part of a, of a large group um, that Emily Johnson was one of the sort of chief organizers of in the beginning called Creating New Futures that came up in response to um, the sort of generally terrible response of, of some large um, institutions to its artist commitments during, at the early, in the early days of the pandemic. Um, and really drawing a lot of attention to um, the way in which this field operates and the, the um, you know, the culture of scarcity and the way in which um, this work is often made on the backs of um, um, of young artists who do this work for little or no money some often. And, you know, um, I think there are organizations like mine and Jack and um, several others that have, you know, um, are doing, I think, really sincere, honest um, work to um, to improve those conditions because as artists, we understand them. Um, I don't mean to speak for you, Alec, but I know that you do understand um, these things very well. Um, but on a larger, like in the, if you look at the larger field, if there is such a thing, there's a lot that I think, um, and also just, you know, the, we all work, we work too hard and we don't sort of have um, this idea of work-life balance is difficult for a lot of people to um, um, to manage. And so those things really, just this idea of why we, who we're, how we're doing this work and why we're doing it, um, <clears throat> we need, um, we don't need to do things in the way that we've done them necessarily. I think often we just do them because that's how we have done them. And we haven't had, a, and to Alex's point, we haven't been given an opportunity to stop and reflect. I mean, I certainly haven't. I mean, running a small um, not-for-profit art, not -for -profit arts organization does not afford a lot of time for reflection. We're just like constantly scrambling to, to make the rent and make the payroll and um, honor our commitments um, to artists. Those things um, are just perpetual challenges. They never, they never let up. Um, if that answers your question. One question. Um, I pass by what's called, I think, the Dillers Island, um, you know. Um, Little Island. Little Island. I mean, it was supposed to be free in the evening. You could at least go. I couldn't even get in. It was, as they called, it was overrun. It didn't look overrun to me. So this is a billionaire who, instead of paying taxes, sinks 600 million or 800, I don't know how much, you know, for, for a pleasure island, instead of you know, supporting organizations like you who even have to raise the rent, you know, with paying the $7,000 rent is life and death. Um, how, how, how do you feel about this? I mean, I know you got help from this organization, but how do you feel about the city of New York? How do you feel about making art? How, how is the atmosphere for you guys? Um, what do you think of, you know, big places like Lincoln Center being closed, but being fully paid, but not doing the work Alex did or you? Famously, the Met Opera hasn't paid singers, you know, uh, since March. Um, some theaters we hear even ask commission money back from playwrights who had started working, you know, because they're not going to do the play. So, so how do you, what goes through your mind in all of this? Alec, you're, 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 you start. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it's kind of, I, I don't know. I've learned to just, it's, it's, it's sorry, it's a little bit tricky. Um, I, I've learned to kind of ignore that world, the world of wealth and the world of, um, of arts organizations that cater to those who are wealthy. It's just not, it's not a, not a world that I'm particularly interested in. The art that's created there is not art that I, I find very alive. Um, and so I, I have no problem anymore. I, I used to get pretty feisty um, about it, but at this point, you know, it's just, it's kind of none of my business. <laughs> wealthy people are gonna wealth. Um, <laughs> and, and so what I, what I guess, what I guess I am sad about is that, um, you know, over the past 10 years in New York City, over 80 small venues have closed, 
right? And that has had has an enormous effect on our theater, uh, theatrical in, infrastructure, um, ecosystem. Artists uh, no longer have these these small places where they can experience. Not, there aren't enough of them to fill the demand from artists uh, of places to experiment, to try stuff out, to develop your voice, to develop your audience. Um, there are now just a few of us uh, as venues that um, that support emerging experimental early career artists. And um, that just changes the city, right? It just, uh, it, it's a confluence of, of that. And also, of course, the rents have gone up uh, for, for renters in the city, enough so that we know that a lot of artists have left the New York over the past 10, 20 years. Um, so it is not the place that I landed 20 years ago. Um, it doesn't have the same energy uh, when you were going to theater from the on the Lower East Side, from from small theater to small theater to small theater to see new work, uh, or in Soho or um, downtown Manhattan. That, that even though Brooklyn is, um, you know, it has a lot of cultural things happening, it, it doesn't have that. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't have. Uh, 20 small theaters that you can kind of hop hop to to check out work um, like it like lower Manhattan used to and so um, that development is is really sad um, it, it's uh, at the same time the work um, that's being created I'd like to think of um, New York as a place where um, at least in, during my tenure in New York my 20 years here um, the art world was a place of ice when I came and it's turned into a place of fire. Uh, I feel like a lot of the work when I first arrived in New York, the work that was getting attention that was exciting to me as well, uh, was quite cold in its aesthetic, a quite cold in its approach, removed, um, not, a, not a lot of passion, but a lot of uh, cool technicality and ideas and concepts, which excited me, certainly as an artist. Uh, right now, I feel like it's a time of fire. I feel like uh, the art that I'm seeing as a presenter that I'm excited about is art that has a lot to say, um, that is addressing um, the fact that this city is not the city that we all want to be living in, uh, the city, that the fact that the society is not the city that we all, the, uh, we all feel welcome in. Um, and, and incorporating that in, in still very creative and imaginative ways into compelling performance. Um, so I'm thinking of um, playwrights such as Jackie Sibley's Drury, um, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, um, Jeremy O'Harris, uh, Taylor Mack. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, any number of, uh, a, a lot of dance art, uh, Diana O. Oh, um, just a lot of artists that are that are making stuff that just feels very different than the than the theater and the performance that I was checking out 20 years ago. Um, so that also feels exciting. I, I, I don't want to paint a picture of New York, a decline in the arts scene. Um, a, there's a decline in the structure of the arts in New York City, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, due to the unaffordability of New York right now for a lot of people, but yet um, artists will prevail. Uh, they, are, they are creating work that is relevant, that is, that is inspiring, um, that is exciting. Um, and so it remains a place uh, where one can really steep oneself in, in great artists and great artistry. Yeah, I totally agree with what um, Alec is saying. I think artists will always find a way. I'm also quite nostalgic for my version, the version of New York that I felt was available to me when I came here, you know, in the mid 90s. Um, I just have these memories of Ludlow Street and um, being able, and, you know, on a single block being there, were, um, you know, four performance venues, it's the first place that I saw elevated repair service perform. The first place I saw Target Margin Theater perform, a bunch of other, many, many other things. Um, and, and I was here for that first wave of, of shift, like right, you know, in the early 2000s, right after 9-11, I guess, something around there, where those venues sort of all disappeared overnight. But then there was a second emergence in, in the outer boroughs 
um, that felt very exciting to me. And I think that this is partially the story of New York is that it's continually changing um, and that nothing can really stay the same for very long in a way, but, um, and Alec said this already, there was, at least in my experience of New York, there was for years, and I think even more before my time here, um, it was somehow possible in New York for artists to find DIY spaces and afford them, and they may not last for a very long time, but if they disappeared, something else would spring up in its place in this sort of really informal community or network of, um, of sort of underground venues felt very healthy and that started to disappear in the last 10 years for sure um and like alec you know i don't have you know we're not the chocolate factory is not an organization that has um much of an entree to wealth um i think i understand i have a pretty clear understanding of how large institutions relate to wealth um i do think maybe on a public policy level i would have some strong criticism of where the where the city has chosen to um, you know, heavily invest in um, places like the shed. You know, you could, one could ask the question of whether the shed does the city need the shed. I would. I mean, I would. I mean, what do you guys think about the shed? Yeah, let's let's talk about. I mean, I don't want to talk poorly of any people, and I, there are people that work at the shed who I actually admire. But then I think you know, I just don't think the city needs something like that. It, the, the city has other, the city needs other kinds of things. The city already has plenty of spaces that fill that purpose. And, and I think this, this just response in response to your comment about Little Island, I think there is just sometimes um, a kind of vanity or ego in this notion that we need to build something new that'll be better than the thing that, we, that was there before, where when the thing that was there before was actually feeding into the economy of the city and the economy of the art, of the performing arts field, actually generating the work and the ideas that are needed for um, for larger and more commercial um, spaces. I mean, spaces like Jack are really important to New York City because so many ideas are created there that find their way into the mainstream. Not that that's, not that that's I'm not saying that that's what you're there to do, Alec, but I think, um, um, Large institutions, the shed being one of them, have to have to need a sort of, um, I don't know to use the metaphor, like they need plankton to feed from. It's not as if those places exist and have the understanding and the resource to generate, to help, to help new emerging artists find a way and find their voice to Alex's point. Places like Jack, are necessary for that. And, and I think that there's just been a turn away because there's there's not necessarily a kind of um, cachet that is legible um, outside of, of its own community. Yeah. That makes any sense. Yeah. I mean, you hosted Danny, for example, Daniel Fish, you know, at a time when no one would give him really a space, you know, and then one day he ends up, you know, uh, with the stuff like Oklahoma on Broadway. But, you know, he comes out, maybe had too long even being in this way, but still, the, you were there. And same with, uh, with, uh, with Alec and the work, you know, with Okada and, uh, and so many, many other things. Um, a question to both of you, let's say tomorrow the new mayor would call you up and put you in charge for the performing arts, for theater. What would you guys do? What would you put in, in motion? Um, I would try to take an investment strategy towards um, kind of like a startup mentality. Um, like it's, you think of Silicon Valley, but um, devote a tr devote a considerable amount amount of resources towards supporting the development of small venues across the city, not just those that exist, but actually easily accessible startup grants. Um, it took us a jack, you know. Mimi and I put our life savings into Jack, which was about fifty thousand dollars. So you went um, to your own bank account to we create did. a space. What New York City yeah. is so famous for that we support the artists, but you had to go to your own bank account. That no. money ran out after about five months. Yeah, and but fortunately, 
Yes. Fortunately, yeah. we had enough activity at that point to bring in enough box office income. Our rent was much lower at that point because it scales up over time. Um, and so we were able to just get by month to month and we weren't eligible for city funding until three years in. Uh, we weren't eligible for uh, state funding until two years in. You have to show that you exist already. You have to show that you're successful already. Yeah. And that is in, that's also true with a lot of the foundations, private foundations. They want to reward success. Uh, but a lot of folks um, who have an idea or a vision, like myself, like Brian and Sheila, um, first of all, they may not have that nest egg of $50,000 to start with. And... Second of all, um, they they you know they may not get far enough um, to get to the point where a foundation would be willing to to get. Because, so the 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 seed money is really important. Um, like so, the worst that could happen is that a project fails, and uh, but then the best that could happen is that another project succeeds wildly and they would kind of balance each other out just like an investment strategy for someone who's investing in startups right you lose some and then you, but then you could win big on some others um that level of trust and risk taking is completely absent in the funding um networks in the city in the state and nationally foundations and whatnot and it just makes no sense to me um that that to support artistic creation which is um, just by nature, risk, you know, it, it's an endeavor that is um, imbued with risk that also the structures around supporting that work would be so conservative just makes no sense to me. I agree with everything you say, Alec. Um, I would add two things. One, um, and this, I don't think this is structurally ever going to happen. And it's, and I'm not, and this is not a blanket critique. Um, and it's certainly much better in New York City now than it was 20 years ago. Um, um, and New York City, as um, compared to most other cities in the United States, is um, relatively speaking very, very generous in, with its cultural funding. I mean, New York City's cultural funding far outstrips the National Endowment for the Arts cultural funding. But in New York City, the majority of, the, of those funds are still um, going to um, a relatively small handful of large cultural institutions that, it, that um, for the most part, are housed in city-owned properties, um, the CIGs, and they take most of the money. Um, I think it would be quite interesting to shift um, the scales on that in a meaningful way towards um, smaller, more grassroots um, organizations. Um, I would also, I think, and the Chocolate Factory um, and I'm so grateful for this, but it did take you know well over 10 years of um, my life and Sheila Lewandowski, my partner here's life to um, make this happen. Um, the city of New York helped purchase a building for us, um, which we now own. And this is the thing that happens almost never in New York. Um, and it took an, an enormous amount of effort to sort of create a structure that did not exist here to, for this to happen. And I think it should happen a lot more. The way in which small organizations can survive um, and achieve not, I don't think actual stability, but more a, a certain, a, a more, um, a certain measure of stability is to own property. Um, and now we know that it's possible, that it can actually be done. And I think that um, the city, if it really wants its cultural sector to to not you know disappear because I, I mean not, I, I mean I don't I don't want to be too doom and gloom I don't think that it's ever going to disappear but it is you know I think more it's um, it's always under threat um, every year I sort of am asked the question how when for how long are artists going to be able to you know tolerate these challenges when are they when are we going to decide that there's some other place that's just better for this kind of exchange to happen. Um, I think if the city could invest, make you know long-term investments in vital but small organizations, help them to own property so that they don't, so that they're not um, at the whim of this the volatile real estate market in New York, that would go a long way. Mm -hmm. So, in one way to say, uh, give startup grants, believe in ideas, you know, don't 
mm-hmm. play, you know, catch 22, so you can only do something. We can only pay you after three years, but you can start it. the first three years if you don't have these resources to own the property. I also would say, you know, the big institutions were 90 to 92% of the budget is fixed. It just goes to the existing places. Uh, and often they actually also complain, maybe for good reasons, even Lincoln said, that, well, it has to raise all the money, it gets very little percentage of the city, but still in our field, that is a lot, but also have big organizations host. What what's would be so wrong if the New York City Opera would say, well, let's give it to here, Arts Center, they can do one opera a year. What would be wrong for, you know, to say uh, um, the Chocolate Factory does one big play at, um, at LC3, you know, and Alec, you know, does something, you know, work maybe with the New York City Ballet ones. Great stuff comes out of such uh, collaborations where institutions, and you spoke about hot and cold, you know, but often actually something is as if those mixes, you know, turbulences come, the hot and the cold streams and ideas uh, do come out and both of it is, is needed. Um, so I, I, uh, I really hope that we will see um, a change. Do you feel that um, Black Lives Matter um, was a turning point? Did it have an impact uh, uh, on, on you guys and on the New York c- theater scene? Will it be a different? It is strange to say. We also we had so many from the Asian community. I know Mimi is you know close to the Asian American, and we had the Native American Spider Women. Other there's no theater you know for a Native American company. It's shocking. Um, there's no Yiddish theater you know which was so big and has influenced so much. There's one in Romania even you know, but not in New York City. Uh, we at the Siegel hosted the Caribbean you know Playwrights Festival. Nobody had ever, which we didn't know at the time, put together different countries have hosted a reading series for Caribbean and they are the largest, if I understand, immigrant group, if you include Jamaica, there's nothing out there. And what would really happen if there would be starts out brands for them, you know, say, go and do a theater in all the five boroughs. And as you also point out, it's not about so much money. You don't have to, it's not right away 600 million or 800 million like a Dillers Island, small things help. Um, that it's even thinkable um, for, but, um, uh, um, do you think that pressure that that movement created is was it serious? Will there be changes or was it lip service? Um, how is it for you guys? You're, you have been champions all along anyway, but but what do you think of the larger theme? How serious is that change going to be? I'll follow the trend of starting first. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yes, I mean, it, it's, there cannot not be a change. Um, it, the, the, force, the force with which this reckoning has come uh, for the American theater, I'll speak specifically over the past year, um, is something that's inescapable. And um, there needs, there, there, there will be change. Um, and for those organizations and institutions that do not change that is just um it's just so clear right now um who those organizations are and um and i think that's also becoming (laughs) there's there's some pressure now from some from funders where so it really actually hits hits these organizations in their pocketbook um which is the is sometimes what really is needed for change in an organization or institution, especially the larger ones. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I think there was an incredible amount of effort and time given as a gift by people of color in making in these building these demands. Um, it's it's uh, it, it's a, a it's a blessing that we have an opportunity to be able to. To, to read and digest as white, as white uh, arts administrators and whatnot to actually read and digest this, um, these demands and these um, demands for change. And, uh, and then the pressure remains, right? Um, there's, there's conti- those demands came out that we see white American theater demands came out, uh, I would say about a year ago, um, maybe a little bit less. Uh, but there are, conti- there are protests in, in Philadelphia right now 
against one of the larger theaters there, the Walnut Street Theater, of which I don't know much. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. much about that theater, but I know there are actual physical protests related to these kinds of demands for inclusivity, uh, for pay, um, and and equity within the organization. Um, so you 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 see that happening. It hasn't it hasn't gone away for sure. I think that was the fear um, a year ago that maybe these maybe this would be a passing moment, but it doesn't seem like that to me um, because especially you have um, funders really paying attention to those protests and actually creating um, a, a, a putting a lot of money into people of color led organizations right now, um, building programs and initiatives around supporting artists of color. Um, uh, whether they be uh, straight up grants or residencies and whatnot. Uh, and you see program scheduling um, for organizations which are releasing their fall schedules, programming, um, that really shifting. I see uh, leadership hires, uh, a lot of new leadership hires around the country, um, a lot of people of color stepping into leadership roles at organizations for the first time. Um, I have a hope that it, it continues and this, that this movement, this reckoning uh, really uh, shifts things in America um, for the good. It will take a long time to, to really create a system that is equitable and comfortable for people, um, for, for, uh, for people of color within white led organizations, white founded and led organizations. Um, but that movement that, that that movement towards that comfort has at least begun. Once again, I agree. I mean, this was, I feel like this was, um, at least from my perspective, this reckoning, you know, as a field, from my, you know, the first 15 years of my participation in the field, you know, um, we were all, I think, allowed to pay lip service to some of these issues. There would always be a question on a grant proposal. What are you doing to address? Um, and, but there weren't necessarily consequences to giving a non-answer or a sort of, you know, a, a really uh, not showing real progress on that. And that really did shift, but pre-pandemic. And I think, um, and it's only been amplified since. Um, and, you know, it's literally pop, for my board at the chocolate factory, it's, possibly the thing that we spend the most time working on is how to how to change the makeup of our board um, to really change it not just to you know just um, there's like there's a really there's a there's this I don't know how to really articulate this well um, you know there's a question of who the people are that make up a staff or a board or an artist artistic program and then there's also the structural issue of how organizations function and there's you know white supremacy is baked into those structures and how um and even persons of color in positions inside organizations that function in this way can feel the pressure to behave to 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 operate within structures that are really white supremacist in their to their core and it's like how can those things change but that, no but i i think that this it's hard for me to, I mean, I have hope, like Alec, I have hope that this is, um, that this is not a, um, a blip or a moment or a swing of the pendulum that we're just going to, you know, move out from. I really think it's lasting. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, so let's see. I mean, we are all experienced maybe for the first time in our life, a moment of uncertainty, where we didn't really know what would happen. Our lives were in danger, perhaps still are, but it seems to be over and um and it was a moment and a time to reflect and you both are you know taking steps towards the future what what are you dreaming about if let's say you know you would get um an investment you would get um, resources um in your space or others what what would you guys do first of all maybe say what are your plans i would love to hear what is happening till 2024 at the Shock but also if you would get resources, what would you do? What would you do? And maybe Brian, we start with you this mm -hmm. time. 
So, I mean, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the quick answer is that, you know, we'll begin, um, we've done a few small um, in-person events at, um, at the old and new chocolate factory spaces, um, you know, for small audiences, sort of informal. Um, small is how big? Well, at the, presently, we were doing them for fewer than 30 people. I think that we will, starting in the fall, I think our first, our first public event will be the first weekend of October. Um, will be at what will be considered full capacity, which um, and even in our new space, because it's even though it's much larger, um, the state of the CFO is that it will st it'll still be 74 people or fewer. So it'll be quite small, um, but we'll start to do that again in the fall. Um, and there is, a, there is a season that's emerging. Um, a lot of, you know, experimental dance and some theater and some other kinds of things and some partnerships with other venues in the city. We've always done a lot of partnerships with, um, with, with colleagues here mm -hmm. um, in New York and nationally. I mean, not generally with um, ABT um, or the opera, but with smaller organizations that we feel a kinship toward, we often partner. We've worked with Jack before. Um, you know, my long-term dream, you know, the, um, and I don't really know, some of it is, some of it is financial, some of it is just how um, some of it is conceptual or spiritual. You know, the chocolate factory has moved into a direction over the years where we are kind of a, we're sort of a, um, a hybrid between residency space and, um, you know, presenting organization. Um, we provide a lot of space, a lot of time in our space to artists to make things. We host a lot of residencies that aren't um, necessarily meant to culminate in a premiere, but, but a lot, but a lot that do um, we've made the shift in the last uh, year and a half toward, um, and it's been really quite, a it's, 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 um, it's immensely challenging, but I think it's a good thing to be doing. We've started to, um, to pay each individual person who, who works on a project in our space. So a director, choreographer, line designer, performer, technician, an hourly wage for each hour that they work in our space. Um, which increased our budget by 40% um, just to do that in the last year. We, 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 had, we received funding to support this and I don't know if it'll, how it will continue or in what way, um, but I would like to expand that because it's still not nearly enough. I would like to expand that. I would like to make our commitment and there are other organizations that do versions of this. I mean, here our center does versions of this, but I would like to, when we, when we talk to an artist about a commission, I would I would love for that to be um, a much long a much more long term commitment to say okay well we're gonna we'll work with you for four years um, and each year we're gonna pay you to do and and to sort of um, and this is the part that I think is trickiest to take to sep to somehow separate the financial um, and structural commitment to an artist from the results and to say we're here to support you and if you want to make a show during that time. Great. If you don't, great. Whatever the end, um, that's a thing that I would love to do and don't really see a path toward doing. I mean, I, just, it's, I don't think it's really feasible within our resources presently. But, and also, you know, because of the structure of funding for artists too, outside of venues, um, it's really hard to get off the train of making shows because that's where the everything is tailored to support that that, uh, that as the finish line. Um, you, you, it's hard to get, I don't know that there is a grant you could get that's just sort of to support, well, I, I mean, I guess the MacArthur or the Guggenheim could be this, you get a grant and it's just um, to recognize the work that you've already done, not to, not to help you get to the mm -hmm. premiere of something. Kind of like a three picture deal in the movie industry <laughs> they say you can do three films whatever you want we pay for it you know yeah and, and you can create something and two of them can be bad and one has to be great basically you yeah. know and well uh, there i mean and to your, your earlier point Alec, like that's you know that's something that i think um in this in um venture capital in the startup world is or in hollywood yes people have these deals where it's just like we just we just want you know we're going to pay you and you're just going to show us your ideas and we may or may not do anything with them, but you're going to get money out of this. Mm. 
Um, yeah, I love that, Brian. And um, I mean, it reminds me actually of Soho Rep's uh, mm -hmm. idea yes. that came out of the pandemic. Also, you know, yeah. really something that as we're looking at ways that arts organizations have been um, able to reflect during this pandemic and come up with new ideas, this is one of the one of the coolest, I felt like, um, which is this project number one they're calling, uh, which is, I think they give their, they select a certain number of artists, a cohort of like nine or 10 artists and uh, pay them a salary for the year or multiple years. Um, and it seems like there's, there's that, that, that approach of not necessarily product focused, but rather we think you're a valuable artist and we want to make sure that you are able to um, pay your living expenses so that you can write or you can uh, create your next show and, and, and explore your artistry. I just think that that's, that's great. And what's more, um, it seems like there's, there are funders now who are really into that into supporting those kinds of visions, such as that, that at Soho Rep. I know that that was a grant funded project, um, or, or at least has become um, supported by a, a foundation. Um, so that there is interest in the funding community in um, giving organizations money to, be, to then give to artists um, a, a significant sums to be able to just, just create their work. Um, so that that's really a, something that we we haven't yeah on, on our radar are, are, are some different efforts but certainly it's something that we're we're learning about that kind of that kind of project um we at jack i mean our big vision is to buy our to buy our own space right um and or to, better yet to have someone buy it for us right um that to have that permanent stability in our neighborhood, a neighborhood with whom we have so many connections and have been, been building so many relationships. Um, we don't wanna end up in eight years at the end of our lease, having to move to a completely new neighborhood because that's just uh, what we can afford at that time. Uh, we are of Clinton Hill. We've been here for nine years and we wanna stay forever. Um, uh, our, our local senior center is right around the corner. They come to see all of our shows. Um, you know, we have we have all sorts of relationships related to the politics of the district, much like the Chocolate Factory has done. Um, Chocolate Factory has done candidate forums for local elected officials in its past. We started doing that ourselves last year, and it found it extremely a rewarding way to be connecting to 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 be proving that an art space is a community space is a political space just inherently um and and to be really offering that service and deepening our relationship to our neighborhood um so so yes certainly our space um uh, buying it is is our big vision um other visions we have well really with that opportunity would, would mean that we'd have $100,000 that we're currently paying in rent that could go to artists, right? That could boost those artist fees. We already have that goal of doubling the artist fees by next year, um, but really it's still not enough. We're not, we're not paying the artists a living wage by any means at this point, even if, even if our, our, our modest artist fees are doubled. So how can we pay them a living? What would that look like? Um, what kind of support can we build to make sure that we are a part of keeping our artists in New York and keeping them focused on what they do best. Yeah, yeah. And I think you both are right. Your space are civic spaces. They are social spaces. They are community places where ideas get exchanged. People see themselves on their, uh, their or that part of their life uh, on, a, on a stage or they see new technology and get comfortable with the moment we live in with the future where you know this will be part of us you try to create meaning and why while you try to do you actually do create meaning and because it's open and it's of significance to have a real engagement and um, going back i haven't been on that dealer island but you know, what comes to mind is that art, I think they said, oh, we're also going to do performances, but it's going to be like on the court of Louis XIV in Versailles, where artists are kind of acrobats and, you know, and do, you know, fancy ballet dances, you know, as a decorative uh, element, you know, of a celebration. 
of the rich and the wealthy, you know, and uh, uh, um, which is already so highly celebrated for wrong reasons in American uh, uh, culture. Um, Tania Bruguera, the great Cuban artist, said um, the French Revolution was an incredible democratic gesture. Why do we go still to the Louvre? Why do we go to the palaces? Why do we go to the big state over us? You know, we can also go and it's true, but why not in the homes of the people, of the workers? Why not in the neighborhoods like Clinton Hill or you know, where Brian is? And why not take you know, interest in the lives of for the people, by the people, with the people? That is our democratic mission. And I think you both do that as so many, so many, many uh, others. And I wanted to have you on here earlier. And I'm it was, of course, you know, happy to have you with us, but it is um, quite, you know, of, um, of, of, of significance, you know, what you do and you make the city breathe and work and it shouldn't be so complicated. It should not be so hard. It would mean very little to people with real financial means to support this instead of creating their own or to redistribute, redistribute some of the wealth to make the city a greater place to create an atmosphere as you both said when you walk through little Love street you know so and the great memories of great atmospheres whether it was paris berlin vienna is in paintings it's in poetry it's in performances in scores you know they were just able the artists to um, note it down but what inspired it was an atmosphere and this has to be real it cannot be manufactured by just the successful people well, it has to be a real engagement and we have a right to access of art, to access of education, the access to healthcare, access to politics. And so you're doing really a very significant work. As the last uh, question or comment, I mean, there is this old joke in Berlin, two artists meet and what do they talk about? You know, they talk about money, and financials, and then, you know, the finance guys meet, you know, what do they talk about? Like art and the opera and Miami, Basel or whatever, you know, so but you guys are great artists. Uh, um, you take such care also of artists. Uh, we just had Sybil Kempson, Sybil Kempson with that. And she said, actually, if I really could do what I want, I want to do Wagner's ring cycle, um, which might be an idea for the chocolate factory. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how that would be possible, but who knows? But what are your artistic ideas also? When you, uh, what would you, are there projects you dream of? What would you guys like to do? Um, I'll jump in. Mm. I've been dreaming a lot about large scale work. You know, I, by necessity, a lot of early career artists in New York have only the small canvas to yeah. paint on. Um, that is, as a performance maker, you are working in uh, 50 seat venues for quite some time. Um, and, and that's also the case for me, although calling me early career is a little bit disingenuous given my, my age. Um, as a middle-aged man, but uh, still, I, as if someone tied to the experimental performance scene, and that's where my work is situated, um, I, I think, why can't we have a, a, an armory dedicated to early career artists, mm -hmm. and, and instead of, um, or as well as an armory that's devoted to European big shots coming over and presenting their work, um, or, or, or more mature artists that are presenting work. Um, uh, I would love to see what so many of the, so many like Zachary Ty Richardson would do with a, you know, with a uh, 20,000 square foot space, um, Justin Allen, um, you know, what uh, Justin Hicks, um, the hot plates, what would, uh, wh how, wh what would writing for that kind of space look like for a playwright, uh, such a large scale um, for me personally, I'm a director, theater director, um, often create work from scratch with my ensemble. Um, I'm just so curious what my work would look like um, in such a space. I have so many visions of different things that I would do in an armory style space. Um, so that's, so that's, that's one thing that's on my mind, um, obviously a little bit unrelated to being at Jack because Jack it remains an intimate space. Um, but it's something that we're starting to think about, oh, is there a connection that Jack can make a partnership with a larger space, either in New York City or beyond, uh, where, the, where, where artists could be in residence in both spaces or, or, or just once, or just the larger space, but have it be a Jack co-production. Um, 
something like that. I've been talking with Raja Feather Kelly also about that. He also aches, the choreographer aches for that kind of large canvas to work on. Um, yeah, that's my contribution. Um, yeah, totally. I mean, I think my comment would be sort of related. I mean, this is, um, and it's sort of, um, it applies to my own work and to the, I, to the work of artists um, I'm interested in and trying to support. You know, I've made this sort of shift into filmmaking in the last um, handful of years. And I made a feature film that came out in 2018 um, that was, you know, inc made on a, on a downtown theater show budget. So it was in um, very, made very, very quickly for very little money. And um, I want, personally, I, I mean, I want to make more films um and i um and i found it quite challenging to just even enter the world um the quote-unquote film world and find opportunities there because these disciplines um i think now in some ways more than in the past are um sort of distinct universes from each other. And I think that one of the things that was a really, a really important principle for me starting the Chocolate Factory, and it's something that I have nostalgia for, even though I wasn't around, like this notion when you hear certain artists who were maybe in their 80s now, who were part of the downtown scene um, in the 60s and 70s, talked about how fluid or his disciplines were. And, you know, poets would hang out with painters and hang out with, and would hang out with dancers. And there was like a kind of cross-pollination happening there that, I mean, I, obviously it's, it doesn't not happen at all, but it doesn't, um, I don't see it happening enough um, in, um, in my world anyway, partially because we're so busy and our work, each of our worlds are so um, rich already. So if you want to just, if you want to keep track of the downtown experimental dance scene that could occupy every night of your week and leave no, no room for anything else. And I know that's even more true for theater. And, um, but I think I would love to see more fluidity between those worlds um, and more ease of, tra of, um, of trafficking between them for artists, which I think is totally related to the notion of scale that, Al that, you, that you brought up, Alec, this idea that, um, of having to be of a certain stature or accomplishments who have access to um, to the really to the grand scale of things is um, it's a it's just a strange construct to me. Like why does that? Why is it even? It makes no sense. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I think you know we 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 really have covered a wild field and the way we scratch the surface, but in some places I think we went in deep, and it just shows there is a need to have these talks, these discussions, and to to think things through. And this moment was a rapture, and um, the car that came to a sudden full stop and was flipping in the air. It looks like at least here in the U.S., perhaps it does land on its four wheels with some scratches, but um, we really maybe have to. Uh, change the direction we are driving to and you know have maybe other drivers and co-drivers and uh, and some new motorists inside to uh, ecologically better so it's a it's a very big discussion and I really would like to thank both of you to give an update in the middle still you know from the trenches and from trying to make that happen you have all our respect for what you created and that it was thinkable for you to make that investment and um and many people, of course, to say, well, you know, they had an access, at least they had something, you know, but many people have that. And actually much, much, much more. And they didn't do it. And what you guys uh, created over years and times over a decade is a model for, for many others uh, to be looked at. It's also working, it's successful, and it makes a real uh, contribution. So um, really, um, all our respect and thanks uh, for, for what you do. We were, you know, as one says, they have the golden cathedrals in Rome uh, and they think they're close to God and there are some little wooden churches in Finland or Scandinavia or whatever you, but who's really closer, uh, you know, to that idea. And I think your spaces are close to the gods of the theater. And I think you're also blessed because of that of your, in your lives and with the contribution you do. And uh, please do go on and, um, 
we hope to stay in contact and perhaps you know you know we would like to try to create some kind of an international festival in new york city if it comes in the summer in two years from now to be a host to use this would be places we we would be thinking of and maybe we can collaborate um, on that it would be a, a great thing to also show that you have to be very local but also global and i think both of you guys and um, that, that they're really um Thank you again for uh, everything you have done. It, we're coming to an end today and uh, to an end of the uh, uh, Siegel Talks. Tomorrow, formally, will be the last one. We have Frances Casadeus Calvo from uh, Barcelona, a very significant uh, festival, Greco, in Barcelona, one of the great European um, um, theaters uh, festivals. Uh, Joe Melillo pointed at us towards them, say, this is interesting what they're doing. We should know about it. What does that mean, a festival for a city? And how maybe can we bring that atmosphere and spirit um, also back to New York? And um, and uh, and we, we will see. Who knows, with five or 10 years from now, how things um, will look like. And um, we are hopeful, but it's a serious time. And also, we cannot screw this up. It has to be a, a better new world we're entering now. And I hope that this uh, will be um, um, in the case. So uh, thank you for spending the time. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting us today. But also, since last March, as uh, incredible commitment they showed you towards this idea so to us. And it has made a real contribution. Thank you for all listeners. I know so many listening and to know that you guys once in a while listen it means so much to me and to all of us here at the Siegel Center because this is the best we can hope for so um thank you and uh stay safe and I hope to see you soon and come to your performances and we have a beer uh, together congratulations on everything and uh, to our listeners stay safe as tune in uh, uh, tomorrow and then hopefully in July around 21st most probably going to do a 24-hour um, saying thank you to all the theater artists globally who took care of communities like both of you guys and highlighting the situation in India, which Abhishek Majumba says it is actually almost state organized murder um, and what is happening there and the Indian government and India itself also should make aware that the world is watching and he asked for help. They are every night they are there out there and I think it's quite exemplary what they are doing. So I hope you both also can join us and read something and talk with some Indian artists and uh, to show our compassion. So thank you all and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.